Hi everyone, let's discuss now uh, how to identify the bottleneck resource, which is also supposed to be our first step in the theory of constraints. Uh, and as I said earlier that the whole concept of throughput accounting is based, is circled around the bottleneck resource. So first of all, we have to identify the bottleneck, then all our planning will be according to the bottleneck resource. So uh, as if you remember in the previous uh, lecture or previous video, when I mentioned initially in the introduction about uh, how to identify the bottleneck resource, normally, if you want to look at it, which process is taking more time per unit in processing, that is going to be our bottleneck resource. But there are cases, uh, you know, sometimes when each process has a maximum capacity, which is different. Like let's say one process has a maximum operating capacity of 100 hours and the other one has, let's say 120 hours. So in that case, the amount of output that each process can generate could be different. And it's not uh, like the case that it's only the process which is taking more time might be the bottleneck. Effectively, the bottleneck is the one that will result in the lowest possible outcome output. If output is less, that is supposed to be our bottleneck. So let's continue the same example which we were discussing. Uh, we will add some more information to it as we were discussing earlier that uh, there are two processes, uh, cutting and shaping process as an example we took earlier. So uh, and as we said earlier that cutting process requires three minutes to produce one unit, whereas the shaping process requires five minutes to produce one unit. So there can be two cases, as I said earlier, one is that both processes have equal amount of total operating capacity. And the other case scenario is that where one process has different maximum operating capacity available and the other one has a different uh, amount of hours available, whatever total capacity or total working hours are available will be divided with the time to uh, time required to make one unit, which will give us the maximum output that each uh, of these processes can generate. And then if a max, if the demand level is also available, we can compare with the demand. If demand, market demand for our product is more, but the processes, one of the processes, uh, uh, you know, are not uh, capable enough to meet that demand. And hence, we will not be able to meet the market uh, demand. Our production will be less. Uh, this process will be considered as our bottleneck. And then all our calculation will be based around uh, this uh, one. So let's see uh, what we have here. Uh, let's say the maximum uh, capacity that each of these processes have. Uh, in one case, let's say it is equal amount of hours. Uh, maximum capacity is 1000 hours for both of them uh, for the whole period. So in that case, if I will consider the output from the first process, is going to be around 333 units. And the second process would be, you know, uh, able to produce a maximum number of units is 200. Now, the question, as we said earlier, is that both processes are, you know, in a sequence. So cutting process, if it will utilize its full capacity of 1000 hours and, and ends up producing 333 units, um, there will be excess inventory because the shaping process, which is next in line, could only process 200 units. So it means that the output coming from the cutting process has to be 200 units, which would then become the input for the shaping process. And this is what actually shaping process can process a maximum. Uh, so cutting process will be made to wait, although cutting process has the capacity to make 333 units, but it will not be utilized. Why? Because if it is utilized, it will result in inventory. And as we said earlier, that the concept of throughput accounting is based on the concept of just-in-time inventory, that inventory should not pile up because it will increase our holding costs. It can get obsolete. Uh, there could be different reasons. So anyhow, the thing is that cutting process will be made to produce only 200 units, which would then transfer to shaping process. And then a finished good will be uh, ready to sell and uh, it will help us to generate the revenue. Now, one more thing that we can do here is, 
there is a concept because just in time doesn't mean that the inventory level has to be zero all the time. Uh, there is a concept that we can keep, uh, you know, small, uh, less level of inventory over here, uh, which could be uh, called as buffer inventory, you can say. So let's say uh, ideally cutting process should produce 200 units, but because there is a risk of, uh, you know, the shaping process has the time, but there is uh, due to some reason, uh, some time wastages, there, is, there can be time gap created. So let's say a cutting process will be made to uh, produce more than 200 units or because it has the capacity to produce up to 333 units. So let's say it is made to produce around 220 or uh, 240 or 250 units. So we can keep some buffer inventory available here. Other than the buffer inventory, the routine process will be that the output from the cutting process will continue to become the input of shaping process. The buffer inventory will be made to wait until needed. Let's say the cutting process slows down, some maintenance work is going on, or there is something, uh, you know, that the, con so what we want is that the process should not stop. The process should be continuous and we will save time. So in short, the uh, in the throughput accounting, it's not about using your resources at 100% capacity. It's about using your resources effectively and efficiently. If you will see here that if a cutting process generates 333 units uh, and there is obsolescence, uh, uh, holding cost is increasing, obsolescence is there, then using those uh, 1000 hours in the cutting process and producing 333 units is actually not helping us out because we can't sell the excess 133 units in the market so it has to wait in the warehouse before the shaping process can actually process it so this is the whole idea and there could be another uh, scenario as i said earlier where uh, we, we have been informed about the different operating capacity available let's have a quick look at the technical article where we have uh, an example which tells us a different operating capacity of uh, each process so here in this example if you will see, we have three processes, cutting, shaping, and assembly. And each process uh, has different time required to make one unit. And the total capacity for each, uh, if you will see, is different. 100,000 hours for cutting process, for heating, and for assembly. On top of that, the market demand is also given. Even if market demand is not given, we will assume the process to be bottleneck, the one that results in lowest possible output. So anyhow, let's see if, if these processes can meet the output. Total hours available is 100,000. And for cutting process, time required for each unit is two, which means that the cutting process can generate a maximum output of 50,000 units. And if we look at the same for the heating process, the heating process could maximum produce 40,000 units, which is not what the uh, demand is. And then if you look at uh, what we have here for the assembly process, it can produce uh, more than 50,000 units. So it means that the assembly process and cutting process have enough capacity to meet the demand. Demand is 50,000 units. Uh, whereas the cutting process has a maximum produ production capacity of 40,000 units within the available time. The available time is 120,000. So this is the key. Now, as we said earlier, that uh, let's say if cutting process will generate 50,000 units, heating process does not have the capacity to deal with those 50,000 units, which means that even if cutting process generates this excess 10,000, uh, 10, which is not something that the heating process can deal with. In that case here, it will create inventory and which is what we don't want because of the risk of obsolescence. So what cutting process will be made to do, cutting process will be made to produce only 40,000 units, which will yes, take 80,000 hours. And as a result, there will be 20,000 hours of idle time here in this process. Same is the case with assembly. Assembly process will also result in some idle time, but it's fine because uh, the thing is that we don't want any excess inventory. We will only uh, uh, follow our bottleneck, which is heating process. So if heating process can produce 40,000 units, then all other processes will also be made to produce 40,000 units. So cutting process will first produce 40,000, then heating and then assembly, and then it will be transferred to the finished goods from where we can sell it to the customer. So demand cannot be met in this case. 
when we will move on, like what we can do is that maybe we can add one more machine in the heating process, which is a way how we can elevate our bottleneck, how we can get rid of uh, this uh, problem because there is demand in the market. So if we can add some more resource, uh, another machine maybe in the heating process, which will allow us to produce, you know, 10,000 more units because the other two processes have the capacity and they might be sitting idle. So if we can add uh, some more time in the heating process that way we can get rid of the current bottleneck which as we said uh, later on it may shift to another process because of the fact that maybe the heating process could then produce excess capacity and then uh, if the demand increases in, in the next period from more than 50,000 then obviously the cutting process uh, is on the edge uh, is on the edge okay cutting process can yes produce 50,000 units, but maximum. So what if the demand in the next period reaches 60,000 units, which cutting process can then meet because of the additional uh, machine we have, but at that time, the cutting process would then become our bottleneck. Reason being that at that time, cutting process will not be able to produce more than 50,000 units if demand increases. So this is how we can understand the identification of bottleneck. And this is something that we might be asked to do as a calculation in the exam. Uh, and this is the starting point. If you don't know the bottleneck, you cannot perform any of your calculation in the throughput accounting. So the key is to identify the bottleneck. If it is given, well and good. If it is not given, then this is how we have to find out. So this is what we have. Uh, next video, we will be discussing about the optimal uh, production plan as we discussed uh, previously as well that how many units yes we have identified the bottleneck but the next thing is that how many units of each product if we have multiple products could uh, possibly be produced in a way to maximize our throughput so this is what we will be discussing our next video till that time take care stay blessed stay safe